Oop. Hello. Just getting my camera set up. We are live. <laughs> we are building an audience for me. I certainly hope so. Um, I am John Aravosis, the editor of America Blog, and this is my Facebook Live daily broadcast that I'm doing between now and the election to talk about uh, various topics, but basically anything in particular that grabbed my interest that day that I thought might be interesting to talk with you guys about. Uh, the other topic I'm going to talk about a little bit later is I've begun a very large fundraiser for my work between now and the election. Um, Basically, all of my income comes from whatever donations I can get from you guys with a little bit extra from advertising. Um, I've got a long post about it on my blog talking about what I plan on doing, why I think I merit some donations, um, and why blog advertising doesn't even come close to paying any bills anymore, unfortunately. It covers about 20% of my costs, actually. Um, but in any case, you can find the link to my fundraiser in the uh, description of the Facebook Live, which hopefully is somewhere on the screen. Uh, but let's dig in. What I wanted to talk today about was the Clinton Foundation. Um, I had a rather large tweet storm, as we call it, meaning a long series of tweets sort of connected to each other on my Twitter handle. Uh, you can check that out at Aravosis uh, a little bit later, because I'm going to talk about the same thing right now. Um, you may have heard <clears throat> in the news the last day, especially actually, CNN's been going crazy on this, but all the media has. Here, I'll take my glasses off for a sec. Um, talking about you know, a new supposed scandal with the Clinton Foundation. Now, the story came about because uh, the Associated Press had did a big sort of blockbuster story today, huge story, about the Clinton Foundation and what AP claims is uh, you know, pay f proof of pay for play with the foundation, meaning that the AP thinks it's found proof that donors were able to give money to the Clinton Foundation in order to get special favors from Hillary as Secretary of State. Now, this is supposed to, you know, obviously it would be a big scandal if that were the case, so the fact that AP has a big story alleging it really became a big deal today. Now, just to show you, you know, what AP was alleging, I'm gonna, my fancy, fancy schmancy iPad, uh, see if I can actually show this to you. So this is one tweet the AP put out today. All right, give you a quick look and then I can actually read it, okay? You can, or you can read it yourselves, right? So AP is claiming more than half those who met Clinton as cabinet secretary gave money to the Clinton Foundation. More than half the people Hillary met as secretary were donors. Imagine, I mean, that's a huge number you'd think, right? Then you've got the, the uh, little tear thing the AP wrote that they were using this for Twitter as their little you know, advertising on Twitter. So read that one too. I can look at it backwards. At least 58 to 154 people. You can read it. I'm try literally trying to read it backwards. Actually, you may be seeing it backwards too. Um, at least 50, 85 of 154 people who met or had phone conversations with Hillary Clinton while she was Secretary of State donated or pledged commitments to her family charity. In other words, AP is saying at least half, more than half of the people she met or had phone conversations with during her entire four years of chair of, a, of Secretary of State were donors of the foundation. Oh my God, right? This is like huge. Well, then I started looking at it, right? And I looked at this and I went, wait a minute. What AP literally just said here is at least 85 of 154 people Hillary met or had phone conversations with while secretary. And I'm thinking, in the four years, she was Secretary of State for four full years, from January of 09 to beginning of February of 13, so four full years. Hillary only met and or talked by phone with 154 people. <laughs> I calculated the number of weeks. It's something like 205 weeks or so that fit into a four year, well, no, we know, 212 weeks, give or take, that fit, I'm an idiot, 208 weeks that fit into a four year period, right? <laughs> So she, every week and a half, she had either one phone call or one meeting, and that was it, in a week and a half as Secretary of State. Now, I have a hard time believing, you know, Hillary was just sitting there playing Parcheesi or something, and, you know, doing no meetings, no phone calls, one every eight days, you know, like the Maytag repairman. She gets a phone call and goes, thank God someone's calling me. I was so bored as Secretary of State. The woman, mind you, visited 112 countries as Secretary of State. Do you think she had meetings there? I mean, this claim from AP is absolutely ridiculous, but this is the mainstay of their story, that Hillary had 154 meetings and phone calls, and half of them were donors of the Clinton Foundation, except that 
Hillary actually had several thousand meetings and phone calls as Secretary of State, so 85 of them being donors is a very small amount of the thousands of people she met and talked to. In other words, there isn't much pay for play, even if it were pay for play, and I don't think it is, there isn't much at all, 85 out of several thousand. And mind you, there were several thousand, or there are several thousand donors to the Clinton Foundation. So if only 85 of them were able to get a meeting with Hillary, that's pretty crappy. <laughs> I mean, 85 out of several thousand were able to get in the door. Again, it seems that contributing millions to the Clinton Foundation doesn't do squat if only 85 out of several thousand could get a meeting with her. Well, it gets worse than that. <clears throat> the big example, uh, just to remind people if anybody's new coming on, we're talking about the Clinton Foundation and the new scandal, quote unquote, that the Associated Press is claiming they revealed today, and it's a bunch of bupkis. So the big proof the AP found, for example, of one guy who came who was a donor who just shouldn't have been meeting with Hillary as Secretary of State was Mohammed Yunus. Mohammed Yunus, now I'm suspecting that the AP writers either have never dealt with international affairs or international poverty development issues, or they were just so young, they just don't understand who, they don't understand history or modern history. Mohammed Yunus, the guy who met with Hillary, who the AP devoted a third of their very long story to as proof that this guy would never get in the door of the Secretary of State's office had he not given money to the foundation. Mohammed Yunus, is a Nobel Peace Prize winner. He won the Nobel Peace Prize because he founded the Grameen Bank. You might have heard of the Grameen Bank or at least the kind of work it does. He founded and created the whole concept and, and raised it to an out for, art form of micro lending. And this is the idea where basically you go to lesser developed countries, developing countries, and you give like two and three hundred dollar loans, mostly to women, which is its own really interesting discussion there that they found by lending the money to women, it was much more effective and they would get the money back basically, and it would be invested wisely. But by investing in women in these developing countries, they found that they got an incredible return on their money. That's who Mohammed Yunus is, the guy who created this entire thing, who founded the Grameen Bank, which is famous worldwide for doing this, and who got the Nobel Peace Prize for his work, in addition to a congressional medal and a presidential medal as well, okay? This is the guy who AP is trying to claim couldn't get his foot in the door to Secretary Clinton's office. The, the, the Mother Teresa of world poverty could not get his foot in the door had he not given a donation to the Clinton Foundation. Now, a co couple other people that are on the list who couldn't get their foot in the door had they not given donations. Melinda Gates. You might have heard of her, the wife of Bill Gates, worth about $50 billion. Now, I'm going to suspect that Melinda Gates could probably meet any cabinet secretary or any head of state she ever wanted to meet without giving any donations or anything else at this point. The whole thing is just ridiculous. Um, there's another aspect of the story that really ticked me off. And I just was watching the news a little bit before we started here. And uh, again, just to remind people, this is a uh, Facebook Live. I'm John Arvosis, the editor of America Blog, and we're having a talk today about the Clinton Foundation. Um, and I want to remind people, to the degree you like the chat we're having, please click the like button, click the share button, and if you can find a follow button anywhere on that screen, although God knows where it is, if you hit it, supposedly it'll notify you in the future when I give these talks. But who knows? Um, the other point I wanted to raise. This was fascinating. I've got CNN on. I'm like looking over. CNN, I just heard them say, well, you know, what does it matter if the, if the Clinton Foundation did good work? I mean, that's not really the issue here, that they did good work. <laughs> okay, a lot of the discussion we've been having came about, first of all, because I think it was yesterday Bill Clinton came out and said, look, uh, when Hillary, or if Hillary becomes president, we're going to cut off all foreign donations to the Clinton Foundation, just, you know, just to be safe for the appearances of propriety. We don't want foreign money coming in. You know, Hillary won't be connected anyway, and I think Bill won't be connected. You know, none of them would be connected to it anyway once she if she became president. But also, they didn't want foreign money coming in, so there was any appearance of impropriety. That was the first thing that the media and everybody went, "Oh, this is bad. Why aren't you doing it now? Why aren't you cutting the money now?" If it's, and it was like, Bill Clinton came out and did the right thing. He said, "Look, if people are raising concerns, then we are going to address the concerns, and just to be safe." Even if we don't have any examples of a problem, just to be safe, we won't take foreign money once she becomes president, if she becomes president. And the counter is, why don't you do it now? Well, this gets interesting. Let me tell you why you wouldn't do it now. At the same time, 
in addition to why don't you do it now, became the why don't you just close it down now? I saw the wonderful Kaylee McEnany, I think is her name, you know, the woman who represents uh, um, Donald Trump on CNN. And very bright, but, you know, very bright go-getter, smart, smart uh, lawyer. Kaylee was talking about today with uh, Keith Boykin, who was on, who's representing our side. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, they could just shut it down. The Gates Foundation can just take over or something. Well, let me tell you what the Clinton Foundation does, okay? The Clinton Foundation, among other things, it does a lot of other things, but funds 11.5 million people around the world for AIDS antiretroviral treatments. They provide AIDS drugs to 11.5 million people right now around the world. How many people is that? The numbers I had, this was amazing. I didn't even know this when I read it. It's, hold on a second. Oh yeah, it's half the adults receiving AIDS treatment worldwide in developing countries are getting it from the Clinton Foundation. And three quarters of the kids getting these drugs worldwide are getting it from the Clinton Foundation. That's how amazing this is, okay? Um, 800,000 kids. If we were to just close down the Clinton Foundation today, 800,000 kids around the world would lose their AIDS antivirals. That is three quarters of the kids getting these drugs and half of the adults worldwide would lose their drugs too. And that's more like, uh, what do we say? That's like 11, 10.6 million, 10.7 million would lose their drugs immediately. That's why you don't close it down immediately. So this is relevant, CNN. When your own hosts are asking the question why we don't close it down, when your guests from the Trump Foundation or the Trump people are asking why don't we close it down, it is important that we have a discussion about how effective this foundation is. Now, the final point I wanted to bring up, and again, we're having a discussion about the Clinton Foundation. I'm John Arvosis with America Blog, doing my daily uh, Facebook Live discussion of the election. The final point that was really interesting that I heard people talking about online today, um, but I wanted to Google it first and make sure this was right, and in fact it was right. Okay, listen to this. George H.W. Bush, the father, the first George Bush president, in 1990 set up the Points of Light Foundation. The point or point of light, points of light, whatever the heck it was, point of lights foundation was set up to, you know, promote volunteering and things like this. This was set up in 1990, in the beginning of George Bush's presidency. It was a campaign promise he made. This is a nonprofit that was set up that was connected to George Bush, that was his little baby. And George Bush even gave awards every year for these, you know, points of light citizens that did great volunteer work around the country. In other words, you had a foundation created by the sitting president that was awards given by the sitting president that was found in the name of the sitting president, but nobody cares about the pay for play because I'm sure nobody gave money to the Points of Light Foundation thinking George Bush would be happy. Oh, no, 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 that never happened. But again, no one complained about it then. Nobody complained about it in 25 years since. The next example, Colin Powell. This was an interesting one. Again, I didn't realize the timing of this. Colin Powell, who you know uh, was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Pentagon under Bill Clinton, uh, well, and Bush before him, and then was also George Bush, the sons, George W. Bush, uh, Secretary of State from 2001 to 2005. Well, Colin Powell is Secretary of State, mind you, okay? Colin Powell is Secretary of State under George Bush. And what happens while he's Secretary of State? His wife becomes chair of the board of America's Promise, which is basically a foundation that collects corporate donations from around the country, and I think probably around the world, to do, uh, to promote, I actually did consulting there, to promote, it's kind of volunteerism, but it's corporate volunteerism. But bottom line is, America's Promise shared by Colin Powell's wife in 2004, while he was Secretary of State, his wife was accepting donations on behalf of a huge organization from big business across America. Why is that not a massive conflict of interest? But this is. I don't know. Well, we do know, of course, because it's okay if you're a Republican. Uh, the final example, I Googled this. This one's true, too. Bob Dole. You remember Bob Dole? Bob Dole was the Senate Majority Leader, uh, Republican Leader of the Senate. Uh, ran for president in 1996. Lost um, against Bill Clinton. Well, from 1991 to 1999, Bob Dole's wife, Elizabeth Dole, was the head of the Red Cross accepting donations from around the world for an organization you know, doing great work again, like the Clinton Foundation, doing great work. Elizabeth Dole did great work at the Red Cross, collecting money from around the world to help 
people in need, in dire need around the world. And guess what? Her husband was the head of the U.S. was the head of the Republicans of the U.S. Senate. He was running for president while his wife was accepting donations for her organization from around the world. How is this different from the Clintons? It's not different from the Clintons. It's not any different than what George Bush did with Points of Light. It's not any different than what Colin Powell did with America's Promise. It's not any different than what Bob Dole did with his wife and the Red Cross. But when the Clintons do it, it's wrong. We've all got to, and we've all got to do the, you know, the, oh my God, it's horrible. I mean, now I just heard CNN too. The, the most amazing thing on CNN I just heard was, well, you know, whether or not there's any substance to the story, whether or not we can really prove that, there's, that there was any uh, pay for play, it just looks bad. And you don't want a story that plays into a pre-existing narrative of the Clintons being, you know, I forget the word, but the idea was, you know, corrupt and shady and blah, blah, blah. Well, I can agree on a, on a, public relations perspective as a campaign professional? Yes, I don't want a story that plays into a negative for my candidate, <laughs> even if the story's wrong. I agree with you. But as media, what you say next is, accept the story is entire bullshit and we shouldn't be promoting it. Um, it's really, I mean, this story from across the board, as I said, just to summarize, you know, you've got, the biggest problem with this Clinton Foundation story is the Associated Press. Basically, they couldn't find any example of pay for play. What they found was they claim 85 donors of the Clinton Foundation were able to get meetings with Hillary Clinton as secretary, but A, they show these donors to be huge people like Melinda Gates or Mohammed Yunus, Nobel Peace Prize winner, in not just Nobel Peace Prize winner, but Nobel Peace Prize winner in development, in, in, in anti-poverty efforts around the world. So he's totally relevant for the Secretary of State. Um, or the other one the media doesn't keep mentioning, by the way, you know who the other big donor was to the Clinton Foundation while she was secretary? Donald Trump. I'd like to know when we're gonna have an independent prosecutor investigation of Donald Trump to make sure he didn't get any special favors because clearly, under all the logic we're hearing from Trump's people on TV, Donald Trump must have given that money wanting some kind of you know, illegal or, or unethical favor from the US government. What was this favor Donald Trump wanted with his donation to the Clinton Foundation? And did he get it? I mean, so basically Donald Trump is calling for an investigation of Donald Trump here too. That's how farcical this entire thing is. Um, sorry, I haven't been looking at the, at the questions because I've, I've been on a roll here for anybody just, I can see one of my cousins just joined, hi Fedra. Um, uh, for anybody just joining, we're having a discussion about the Clinton Foundation and the, you know, the latest scandal today about uh, whether in fact there's evidence of pay for play, which there really isn't. Um, I'm just looking here. Yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, how many, uh, Walt says, how many of the donors are people she might be having contact with anyway? That's exactly the point. When you've got people like Melinda Gates, Melinda Gates and her husband, Bill Gates, are not just you know, huge billionaires involved in everything, but they run the Gates Foundation, which funds the Clinton Foundation, but also funds work around the world. They are huge. Of course, the US Secretary of State is going to meet with somebody like that. Um, the, uh, what else have we got here? Do, 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 do. Hillary haters are evil. Um, facts make the head hurt from Timothy. I agree with you, Timothy. Timothy. Suzanne Shea says, bottom line is that the AP and CNN are basically writing for children. They're writing for, or they're waiting for children to die. Yeah, in Latin America and the Caribbean for AIDS antivirals. That's basically it, yeah. Um, so anyway, I mean, that's, that's sort of my rant today about this AP story. You know, I understand where AP came from. I understand why AP wanted to investigate this. Uh, a reporter from Politico today uh, chatted with me on Twitter and it said that, you know, but the problem is, or he asked me how I felt. He said, how do you feel about the fact that I'm going to take it face value that he says this is a fact. How do you feel about the fact that, you know, the Clintons were, were not really very helpful to reporters. They weren't giving the information people wanted about the foundation, um, you know, that it had to be foiled or whatever. You know, I guess a couple things. One, sure, in a perfect world, I guess we want everyone to be as transparent as possible. I will say that, you know, I'm not a Clinton. I haven't faced 30 years of people trying to destroy me for no reason. And when I say no reason, I mean most of the scandals, you know, that, that Trump repeated this one the other day, you know, Hillary killed her, her friend Vince Foster, give me a break, you know? Um, there have been so many scandals that weren't scandals with the Clintons. Yes, there were a few big ones, 
you know, as, as, there, were a few, there were a few big ones as well. We all know of them. But, but overall, these scandals have been, out, been, been blown out of proportion. And for 30 years, these folks have faced them. I'm not surprised that when yet another investigation comes up, that the Clintons kind of go, you've got to be kidding me. You know, I'm not opening my door to you and kissing you on both cheeks. I, I just, I, just because the fact that someone isn't necessarily as helpful as you'd like them to be with an investigation doesn't mean that therefore we should conclude that they did anything wrong. And in this case, I think the AP wasn't able to prove that the Clintons did anything or that, yeah, that either Clinton, I guess, because you've got Bill running the foundation, that the Clintons did anything wrong. So they started to play funny with the numbers. They played funny with their descriptions of the numbers by putting, and, and you know now, this is going to be out there on the net forever, this fake quote about the fact that half of all of Hillary's meetings and phone calls as Secretary of State were with donors of the Clinton Foundation. That is gonna be everywhere, and no one is gonna say, well, no, what the AP meant was they only looked at 154 meetings and phone calls, and half of those, Hillary, were, were donors to the Foundation. But she had a lot more than 154 meetings and phone calls in four years as Secretary of State. We know that. Um, I'll see if anybody else has any other questions. Otherwise, I'll do a quick little chat about my fundraiser as well that I'm having. Um, oh, here's one, I mean, from James Wynn about all of this. Uh, the most ridiculous charge is that the Crown Prince of Bahrain wouldn't meet with her without donations. <laughs> yeah, he's the heir apparent, deputy prime minister, deputy supreme commander, etc., of an ally nation. That was one that stuck out to me too, was, yes, the Crown Prince of Bahrain, which basically means the guy who's going to be king after the king dies or, or leaves or steps down, um, we're supposed to believe that he couldn't get a meeting with the Secretary of State uh, you know, unless he gave lots of money to her. He's the incoming king of Bahrain. I have a funny feeling he would get on her calendar. This is the problem is they're not, it's not like these are uh, ambassadorial appointments. That's kind of the way the AP was spinning the story as though it's, God, who was the one? I don't remember whether it was an Obama one or whether it was a Bush one, but the guy like was running gas stations in the Southwest or something. Somebody who got to be a, uh, an ambassador, but I remember he was like a gas station tycoon or something. It was just the perfect example of what people look at and go, okay, clearly this is somebody who maybe shouldn't have gotten an ambassadorship. That's the way AP sort of spun this story, as though, you know, the guy running Joe's Diner got to meet with the Secretary of State because he gave a million dollars. But in fact, the only examples they can find are these people who are super famous. Oh, what are the other example? Mac AIDS, which is another huge corporate AIDS donor organization that does work around the world that they got to meet with Hillary too. Well, of course they got to meet with Hillary. They are a, I even know of them and I don't, I've done AIDS work in the past, but I haven't done any in years. They're another huge organization doing really important work on AIDS around the world. And as someone reminded me of today, AIDS has been one of Hillary's pet causes for 20 some years now. Yeah, she had that snafu a couple months ago, which, you know, Whatever, that was a snafu, that was a mess, but it was also crazy. That's not, that's just not her history. Hillary's history on AIDS, she, there's a wonderful photo back in 1990 or 1991, I think it's 91, during the campaign when her husband was running for president, Hillary, early 1990s, showing Hillary meeting with AIDS activists and at one of their meetings. And in the early 1990s, you just didn't meet with AIDS activists if you wanted to be president or the first lady of the United States. You know, you, you just, I mean, unless you were running to be, you know, the representative from San Francisco, it just wasn't done. You know, people with AIDS were considered pariahs back then. And the fact that Hillary running, running for first lady, I'll put it that way, would go and meet with AIDS activists and go to an AIDS organizing meeting in 1991 is huge. You know, we're still talking about an era where people were afraid to touch people with AIDS, where people were afraid to be around them, where people with AIDS were, say, were still saying, they still felt, because I know friends of mine did, that the Bush administration was killing them back then. There was that much an, uh, antipathy between government and people with AIDS, yet this woman coming in trying to argue for why she and her husband should be in the White House were willing to embrace these people. Hillary has a long-standing history with AIDS, and... And that's sort of one more reason why, of course, Mac AIDS and some of these other people would get into the White House. Um, any other questions from folks here? Let me see what else we got here. Um, how does the Clinton Global Foundation compare with the Trump Foundation? <laughs> Daniel Bennett asks, how does the Clinton Global Foundation compare with the Trump Foundation? That's really funny. You know, the only thing is, I don't even know what the Trump Foundation does. I don't know if anybody on here does, if you want to type a quick comment or something. Um, you know, I'm going to guess the Trump Foundation probably isn't responsible for saving the lives of most people with AIDS around the world <laughs> with, with, with paying for subsidized drug prices. I'm just going to guess they don't. Um, 
Oh, and yes, Cher. I know I don't have my Mickey Mouse ears today. Those are the plates on the wall the other day that looked like I had ears on. Um, just to remind folks, if you see the like button, feel free to click it. Uh, the share button as well. Uh, all of these things, according to Facebook, help to... Um, Apparently, it actually helps to give this video later on because the recording will stay on Facebook. Um, it helps to give it higher priority in people's news feeds um, based on the number of likes and things. That's what Facebook said. So they said to make sure you remind people. Um, you know, the last thing I'm going to mention, I put in the description of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of our discussion today. If you can see the description, it should be there. Otherwise, uh, look once it ends and you'll see the link in the description. I put a, a link to a big fundraiser I'm doing now for the next week or so. Um, I am trying to raise money for my work between now and the election. What I am proposing to do is what I do best, which is to blog, um, go on Twitter like a maniac like I did today, uh, come up with you know, many sort of instant websites that are very damning and can go viral attacking Trump, and basically to do all the kind of online advocacy that I've been doing for, for 20 plus years now, um, going after Trump between now and the election to make sure he loses, Hillary wins, and that we can win the Senate, which now apparently people are talking we actually could win the Senate back, Democrats, and hopefully the House. And the House is a bigger stretch, but we've got three months, to, a little less than three months, maybe 11 weeks to do it. Um, I've got a very long post on my blog that walks through um, why I think why I think I deserve to be helped. Um, I wanted to make sure I did a very long analysis and description of the work I've done over the last two decades, the work I've done on gay rights and LGBT rights, uh, the work I've done on a number of progressive issues, you know, I won't bore you guys by going through all of it now. Um, you know, maybe I'll do a separate <laughs> sort of broadcast and talk about that. But I walked through a number of the different campaigns I've done that have successfully done, you know, taking on the Russians on the anti-gay stuff, taking on the Obama administration on the Defense of Marriage Act that initially they were defending, um, you know, going after major corporations. Uh, my campaigns have won against America Online. Uh, we've won, oh, my Twitter handle is Aravosis, so you can just go check it out, my last name, A R A. V as in Victor O S I S. Um, campaigns going after America Online, going after Microsoft. Uh, I went after Microsoft when Microsoft said it was no longer going to support uh, the gay community. It wasn't going to support any kind of national gay rights legislation anymore, even though it did historically. Went after them, got them to change it. Um, Ford Motor Company said they were no longer going to advertise in the gay press. Launched a campaign, beat them. Um, time after time after time, and I, I sort of I hate talking about myself in this regard. Um, so maybe go read the post because it's much longer and a much better explanation of all the things I've done. But I guess my point is to just sort of tell people the kind of work I do, which includes doing these talks here on Facebook, um, nobody pays for it. Uh, when I do Facebook talks like this, there are no ads. I mean, there's ads for Facebook, but there's, I don't get any money for this. Um, I don't get any money for doing the work on Twitter. Uh, that's money Twitter gets. Now, Twitter is so hugely important I will say this as a journalist and an advocate, and this again is worth almost its own Facebook talk to talk about. Um, Twitter as a journalist, it is amazing. I follow all the top journalists. I follow all the top sort of net roots folks, the big liberal progressive types, you know, uh, whether it's the MSNBC people, whether it's other great uh, progressives like, you know, Marcos at Daily Coast, or I mean, you name it, a number of the, God, there's so many women now, which is great, uh, not just in the net roots, but I mean, in the media, uh, Jill Filipovic, or, Filipovich, I'm gonna get her name wrong, who I just love, love following her. Uh, Joy, Joy Reid, we all know Joy is amazing. Um, but on Twitter, just today for example, I did the tweet storm about the Clinton story. I didn't have time to actually write the post. I plan on doing it, but it'll have to be tomorrow. I think I mentioned in the preparation for this, I had, I've got a pinched nerve and up until an hour ago was at the doctor's office getting an injection in my neck of, of uh, steroids or whatever in my spine, which is really quite a thrill. Um, so I didn't have time to write the story, went on Twitter, even at the expense of not getting ads, went on Twitter, did a tweet storm where basically you write a series of tweets and you link them all to each other. You'll go, if you look, you'll see the first one's titled, or it's numbered one, and right after it is number two, number three, number four, and it's a way of getting out a lot of information in a way that people can share easily. Well, this went great. It was all about what I just talked to you, the Clinton Foundation and how AP screwed up. Well, put it out there, a ton of people found it useful, sent it around to everybody else. And what was interesting is I started getting journalists responding like this Politico reporter who, you know, legitimately wanted to engage me in a discussion on it. That's the neat thing about Twitter is you actually can engage with people. Jake Tapper is another one who I really like Jake at ABC. Good guy, very honest, earnest, fair journalist. Um, 
And Jake is wonderful for engaging. I think, I mean, he, he'll engage with me. I think he'd probably engage with anybody. If you, you know, tweet at him and something respectful or something, you've got a legitimate question, Jake will respond. He's a great guy. The reason I'm sort of raising this is one of the things I found very helpful in my advocacy is working on Twitter and just helping get the discussion going, helping mold the discussion with the lead thinkers in the media, the lead thinkers in politics, advocacy, I've got, I've, I say only 16,000 Twitter followers on my, Amer- on my Erevosis account. We've got 80,000 combined with my America blog accounts, 80,000 followers. But even just with the 16,000 on my uh, Erevosis, there are so many key journalists and sort of Washington political people on there that I'm actually able to drive the discussion. And I love that, but by doing it, I don't get a dime. Every time I put something on Twitter and try to get it to go viral, I don't get a dime because there's no way to monetize it. Now, the problem is if I put it on the blog, it's still not going to raise that much money. Um, as I said, I, I'm pulling in 20% of my bills and my bills are not, you know, building $5,000 websites. My bills are paying my rent, paying my, my uh, health care and paying my electricity. The blog brings, brings in 20% of that. That's it. So even with the election now, I'll be lucky if the blog gets to 30%, you know, with the increased traffic. That's why I'm doing this fundraiser. I'll, I'll sort of stop beating a dead horse. But... Um, you can find the link, as I said, in the description to this video. If you can't see it right now when I end, look at the description, click, go to my page. I go through a long explanation of, of my work experience, what I've done over the years on progressive causes, and then the form is there. If you feel like you can donate, I'd really appreciate it. My goal is to basically just try to raise money between now and the election for the next three months so I can just do all of this work, not worry about advertising, which isn't going to happen. Um, you know, the final point I'll make is, I've been doing well with consulting here in New York. You know, I worked at the UN last year. I actually am thinking it would be interesting to do a separate talk here at some point about activism overall and people like me, meaning people who sort of become activists but are also journalists, a little bit of a public figure, um, but also tend to have real jobs in the sense of, you know, I do some consulting too to pay the bills and how feasible that really is and why I think it's important for people to support us, not just me. I mean, I look at Daily Coast. I look at uh, even the media sites that are out there that uh, Daily Coast is media, but what I mean is BuzzFeed or something, you know, the big media sites, because it's it's been really hard to fund anything nowadays for media, really, it has been. Um, And what I found last year, you know, I went to work at the UN. I was heading up uh, the online department at, at the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, top internet strategist for the agency, you know, best job of my life, best pay of my life, best benefits. We had six weeks vacation. I mean, it, it was ridiculous. But I got to tell you, I left after a year. I wasn't happy. You know, I mean, I'm not going to sort of go into details because I don't believe in you know knocking previous employers. Um, but I learned, I learned something I already knew. And what I mean by this is, I always knew this, but it was very interesting to finally go through it and to experience it. I always knew as. Someone who has always had, I've almost always had a job, other than when I was flipping burgers, you know, when I was 14 at the pool, um, I've almost always had a job that meant something to me, you know, that I actually felt like I was making a difference. Even when I was on the Hill, you know, I was working for a senator and way back then I was Republican, you know, my, my shady past 25 years ago. But even then, you know, I was doing good work for the state of Alaska. I was fighting for local pilots that were having problems and it was still, oh, actually we were, uh, anyway, a lot of different things. We, we got one of the big things I worked on was I got health benefits for the human shields that Saddam Hussein took in uh, 1991. Remember when we invaded Iraq the first time and Saddam took all those Americans as human shields and put them in plants? We were able to get them uh, health benefits and I think social security benefits too. We got a law passed and I stayed up till 4 a.m. to get that damn thing passed. Um, so I was able to do work that was really, I mean, it was like my little share of the Iraq war that I was able to do a humanitarian angle that was really neat. Um, since then, even better from, you know, Children's Defense Fund, Child Poverty, the World Bank. I know people have got a problem with the World Bank. I got to do some really neat work on Mexico and trying to figure out, you know, a bunch of poverty solutions for Mexico. Anyway, my jobs have always been really cool and really having an impact. And I found at the UN, it just stopped being that way, you know? And again, it was the most money of my life, the best benefits of my life. They even have pensions there, a pension. My staff made more than I've almost ever made in my life. And this was my staff at the UN, okay? But I, oops, sorry, my table. I wasn't happy. It was the first time I actually felt like we weren't accomplishing anything. We weren't, we just weren't accomplishing anything. Um, So I left, went back to work on my own. I've been doing some consulting. The consulting's been good, you know? um, It's been important enough 
but still, you know, the consulting is helping organizations with their web presence, which is what I do. You know, online marketing, um, helping them figure out some big campaigns to do this year on various issues, things like that, and that's great. But what I love is this more advocacy journalism I do, which is basically trying to figure out how do we take an issue, how do we blow it up, how do we impact a big important player, whether it's a good guy or a bad guy, you know, excuse me, whether it's the president and we're trying to get them to do the right thing faster or an even more right thing, in other words, when Obama's working on healthcare, but we want the public option instead, you know, so it's it's a good person going in the right direction, but they still need a nudge, or whether it's a bad person, you know, with a lot of our work on the Bush campaign that we did, but also you know, going after the Russians. I mean, it was friends and me who went after the Russians and made the fact that uh, the Russian the Russian homophobia problem we made it an international story. People had no idea that that other than a few activists, people had no idea the Russians were mistreating their LGBT community that much. And a group of friends and I got together, Dan Savage, uh, Queer Nation New York, were, were some of the really key players, and we blew that story up, a small group of people. You know, that's the kind of thing you can do. I, it's funny, I used the Margaret Mead quote, you know, the small, it's amazing this, what a small group of committed individuals can accomplish. It's the only thing that ever has. It was, that was a George Bush bastardization of the quote, but you know what I mean. You know, that basically a small group is the only thing that ever has created change. The problem is nobody funds a small group. <coughs> Excuse me. And I learned that a long time ago. <laughs> you know, and I unfortunately I think it's our job, and maybe we failed a little bit as activists and advocates, of explaining to people that nobody's paying for this. <laughs> you know, nobody is paying to keep that light on. Um, and that they basically we start. So again, this isn't just about me, but overall. Keep in mind the people you know who are doing really good work, the activists you know who are really kicking kicking butt, and if you can help them out, great. Even better, if you know somebody with a lot of money who can help them out, I, let me tell you for a fact, rich people never step in and say, you're doing amazing work, could I cut you a check to go crazy for six months going after X, Y, and Z issue? They don't do it. it does. If I become, when I become billionaire, I tell people I wanna create my, uh, my sort of SWAT fund where if my SWAT angel fund, where we will just, you know, we will just fund assholes for justice around the world, find the best people that kick ass and just fund them. In any case, I'll stop rambling, see if there were a few more questions and then we can, oh God, Jeff Gannon. Yeah, my Jeff Gannon campaign, actually that was, that was my first, it wasn't my first big campaign. My first big campaign on my own was Timothy McVeigh, the not not the Oklahoma City bomber, but Timothy McVeigh, who was a sailor who, had, who was outed by America Online to the Navy. And I heard about his case. He was about to get kicked out in about 10 days. Contacted him online, said, you know, I'd like to help you for free. He said, sure, I got nothing to lose. Blew that thing up. Uh, Time, it wasn't Newsweek. It had to be Time. Time Magazine eventually listed it as one of their top 100 stories of the year. We blew that thing up so big. He ended up getting a lawyer as a result of the publicity and Tim won. He got a huge settlement. He retired at basically age 28. Um, the other big story that first year was Matthew Shepard, which a lot of people don't realize I was the one who blew up the Matthew Shepard story. Um, long story there, but I basically had talked to a number of a, uh, gay organizations back then and said, look, this story is going to blow up and it needs to blow up. It's going to go huge. We need to make it go huge. I want to launch a website about it right now. We can start collating all the information. The gay groups told me ah, it would take like two or three weeks to get press and everything on that. It's not worth it. I got a friend of mine, Sean, uh, God, I'm forgetting Sean's actual name, but Sean, pa- who, who was Sean Patrick Live at the time, who was running uh, the, he was the male Jenny cam, you know, the camera 24 hours a day in his house. Sean said, you know what, let's create this website. There's this whole new technique people are doing where they're basically, this is 1998, mind you. Sean said, there's, you know, you post an update and then you post another update above it and another update above it and you just keep letting the content flow down the page every time you put a new update. He was talking about a blog, but this was 1998 and we didn't call them blogs back then. So I created a blog about Matthew Shepard. Within a day that thing exploded, I still found a, uh, I think it was a, I don't know if it was an AP story, a Yahoo News story that listed my website as one of the key, the four key sources along with his fam- the, the family, like the family, the university, HRC, human rights campaign, and me were the four sources of information on the thing. So that's the kind of work I've done over the years you know, I've realized I've got to brag about it a little more because I think people don't know the work you've done. But, um, sorry, and Jeff Gannon. Jeff Gannon was the hooker working out of the Bush White House 
who, a male hooker working out of the Bush White House, who started working one month before the Iraq War and somehow was getting a daily pass to get into the White House, even though he hadn't been through sec the necessary security clearances, as a hooker who was $20,000 in debt to the state of Delaware. But somehow, this guy kept getting into the White House. And that was a story. It started on Daily Coast, and somebody finally contacted me and said, hey, there's a, there's a, a gay angle to this story. You've got to get involved. So I started writing about it, and lo and behold, I started writing about it. Uh, CNN had me on to talk about it. And because of my CNN appearance, a guy contacted me. He said, hey, you know, I built that guy's por uh, uh, porn, not porn, uh, uh, what do you call it, prostitution website. And I said, what do you mean? He was, he was running a prostitution business? He said, no, no, he was a prostitute. He was a Republican male prostitute in 2004. Story exploded. It was, it was really credited as one of the first times the Bush administration actually we actually punched sort of the Bush administration in the front, in the face, and and got a real you know got, got a real uh, impact against them. Um, oh yes, Joan, I was a Republican. This is mind you, this is back 1989. Um, that's its own very long story. But you know, grew up in the Chicago suburbs, very moderate Republican territory, and you know, I was a Republican. That's how I grew up. Um, it's a very long story that I'm happy to share someday. But in a nutshell. Uh, reconnected with a very old friend in 1991 who ended up having AIDS um, and we was living in Montana, Paul Clark, and we just sort of instantly became good buddies that we had met in debate camp at Georgetown in high school. About the geekiest thing you could ever do, <laughs> debate camp. Um, and Paul and I became fast friends there. We reconnected. I visited him several times that year and he finally died. And But in getting to know him, I wasn't out yet. I mean, I'm gay, but I wasn't. I. Nobody knew I was gay. I was terrified of anybody finding out. And in getting to know Paul and his friends and getting to know his family and seeing just how open they were with him. And they didn't, mind you, this is 1991. They didn't care that he was gay. I mean, they didn't care. They didn't care that he had AIDS. I mean, it was, it was amazing. Um, but that was a real, that was a seminal, that was the seminal moment for me in terms of my own coming out, but also my advocacy. That's what finally did it for me. And I remember talking to a friend and, who was uh, Barbara Mikulski's chief of staff at the time, a wonderful woman who I was then out to because I started coming out to people as a result of Paul and telling her I wanted to make a difference for my, I wanted to do something for my people. I wanted to free my people. This is 1993 or so. And I remember her kind of telling me, you know, what are you gonna do? There's nothing you can do. Um, and I started volunteering at HRC, the Human Rights Campaign, the big, or it was HRCF back then, um, literally stuffing envelopes pizza night and I was like, I can't do this. I'm a lawyer working on the Hill. I can't stuff envelopes. I, there's, I can do better than this. And very long story, but Ted Kennedy's office, I met somebody working there and his staffer, Michael Iskowitz, who works on AIDS and uh, was working on AIDS issues, women's issues, disability issues, all of sort of the, the really do good progressive issues. Michael said, God, come work for me. You know, I'll, you, can, you can help me. So every, literally five nights a week, I would go to Michael's office after working in my Republican office. I'd go to Kennedy's office around six o'clock and I'd stay until midnight, five nights a week, very often on the weekends too. And it was amazing. I mean, we, we worked on Don't Ask, Don't Tell together. Um, we worked on the first end of hearings in 1994. I got to interview and write the testimony for Cheryl Somerville. Uh, I even got to do things I can't tell you about. Some of the ghost writing I did that was, I someday in my memoirs, I'll tell you who I got to ghost write for. It blows my mind to this day. It was just amazing. That's the kind of stuff I got to do. And that, that combination with my friend dying and with Michael sort of showing me that there was a way you could get involved to make a difference is what then just shoved me into all. And then the internet was finally like my epiphany, my empowerment, that I found a way to channel sort of all of this, you know, advocate angst I've got, I guess. Um, lots of little comments though. I'm sorry, what else have we got? Yeah, Jeff Gannon. I am Chicago. Yep, share. Oh God, if you can't tell by my accent, even even the other day here in New York, somebody said to me, oh God, you're from Chicago. Um, I don't know if folks have anything else. That was sort of a long about, long about way. Oh, thanks, James, for saying you follow me because of the tweet storm. Um, yeah, and folks have posted my different Twitter accounts. America Blog is basically just the stories from the blog. America Blog Gay, the same thing. Although America Blog Gay, I also try to retweet just a lot of what I consider important gay tweets from, or LGBT tweets, uh, from anybody, anybody around the world who's got an interesting story on LGBT issues. So, uh, but on my main Erevosis, it's a little bit of everything. So feel free to go there. Um, 
But anyway, all right, well, I'll sort of finish up now. I feel bad because there's still 26 people on here. I don't know if there's anything else folks want to talk about. I mean, I'm happy to go a little bit longer. I'm not dying from my spinal thing. Um, <laughs> I'll probably collapse after this. Um, you know, do click the likes, do click the shares. Um, but if there's no more questions here, dee -dee -dee -dee. I'm back at, I am back at America Blog, Joe, yes. I was just saying earlier, I was working at the UN, but I left after a year because I just didn't find it that fulfilling. And I, I, you know, this is my calling. This is what I'm good at. It's what I care about. And the question is whether I can, <laughs> whether I can, I can make enough to keep going. But uh, as I said, I've got the, the link in the description of this broadcast. You can see the link to go to my blog where I've written a very long essay about the fundraising campaign we're doing between now and the election. Um, why I'm raising the money, why I think I, why I think I could be really effective taking on Trump. Um, I've really been sort of busting my ass anyway the, the last couple of weeks just so I could show people once again the kind of impact I can have, but it's not the kind of thing I can keep doing. I, I mean, I'm literally paying my expenses out of my savings right now and my savings are back to, you know, low level they were at before. So um, Anyway, I hope to not have to go get a job job because I'd much rather be doing this all day and doing the activism and working on the election. So to the degree you can all help me. I guess I'll make one final point there because this is actually funny. Back, well, back before when I was doing America Blog full time, I remember whenever I talked to people and they'd say, oh, you know, what do you do for, I blog. Oh, you blog for a living. That's it. What do you do? I said, well, you know, I write about politics. We do a lot of activism. You know, we'll write about sort of depends what's going on each day. And then if there's something particular, I mentioned some of the issues I've worked on. You know, we'll sort of beat it to death to get congressional action, executive branch action, you know, a journalist to change a story. Who knows? You know, raise money for candidates, whatever. And the person said, oh, okay, but I mean, like, after asking me what do I do for a living, and I said I blog. I said, but like, how many hours a day do you do that? I said, well, you know, I mean, I sort of get up a little late because I'm up late working. I'll get up maybe 9.30 or 10, and I'll write until sometimes midnight, you know, because there's sort of CNN stuff to write about. And the person went, my God, I mean, you do that full time? <laughs> that much? I said, it's my job. Yeah, but I mean, but you do it full time? <laughs> <laughs> and they were blown away that this was something like I spent full time doing, even though it was my career. And I think when, when you tell people you blog, it's always been, a, I think maybe now there's a little more respect because people realize blogging is just journalism in a sense. But I, but I think sometimes people just don't get that, like, yes, you can spend all day blogging, tweeting, and doing videos and making a huge difference in politics and the world. And it's a job. Of course, it's only a job if you can raise money to pay for it. So. God bless you all. Hopefully you can help me. Um, I will close with that. I think that was a pretty good talk about the Clinton stuff. Uh, I'm happy. I think this will give a nice sort of record of it too for people to share and for me to share on the blog too so that at least there's a good sort of oral explanation of why this Clinton Foundation story is such BS. So, um, all right. Well, thank you everyone. I appreciate you coming. I'll, even though there's 26 people, if there's no more questions, you know, I'll wait one more second. Any more questions or anything? Any last topic? You folks, even a totally different topic, anybody wants to talk about it for a few minutes or I won't, like I said, otherwise I'm gonna go nuke some tortellini in the, <laughs> in the microwave and, and watch CNN and tweet angrily at Corey and Kaylee. Okay, I don't see any more questions. You know, if anybody has any more and you put some afterwards, I'll be certainly willing to weigh in. So, all right, this is a John Irvosis with America Blog, uh, editor of America Blog, having just finished a long talk about the Clinton Foundation. If anybody's new, once I finish, uh, in a couple minutes, the video will be up on Facebook and you'll be able to watch it from the very beginning or scroll ahead or whatever you want. And you'll sort of see the long discussion on we just had about the Clinton Foundation. So thanks everybody. I'm gonna do these, part of my commitment on the fundraising is I'm gonna do these every day at least Monday to Friday. I will do one of these a day between now and the election. Uh, and if there's stuff going on on the weekend, I'll do it then as well. Uh, so we can have, uh, uh, so I can sort of do my public education about what's going on in politics and you give you guys a, a back and forth chance and frankly so I can sort of see how this works and see if this is worth doing in the long term Facebook Live. So, all right, thanks everybody. I'm going to hang up now since there are no more questions. I appreciate you coming. Bye bye.